Welcome to the Men's Reformed Fellowship, a ministry of First Presbyterian Church in Perkasie, Pennsylvania. Our men's group meets at the A&N Diner in Sellersville. We meet each Thursday at 8 o'clock uh, at the back of the restaurant. Uh, today, uh, we made our way through chapter 16 in Dr. R.C. Sproul's book, e Essential Truths of the Christian Faith. For this chapter, we're looking at the holiness of God. This is a very important chapter. Of course, they're all important in their own way. But the holiness of God directs us to something of the essential character and being of God. It's a rather unique attribute in that it speaks of both the nature of God as God. He is distinct from us. He is our creator. At the same time, it speaks of uh, the character of God, who he is. Uh, and so it encompasses his moral perfection, his purity, his goodness. Um, both concepts are uh, prevalent in this idea of holiness, and uh, both concepts are uh, very powerful in terms of our relationship to God. If we are going to have a proper relationship with God, we need to understand him as our creator, as far above us, as transcendent over us. And at the same time, we need to know that this God who is transcendent, who is glorious, majestic, is also a God who is good, who is morally pure, perfect. Um, as uh, one of the prophets in the Old Testament writes, he's, his eyes are too pure to look on evil. So this is the nature of God, the God that we serve. And I think that if you were to take an opportunity to look through the course of church history and to review uh, especially great revivals within the church, many times they occur because the church has had a sense of the presence of God in his holiness in their midst. And so the glory of God comes down upon a congregation, a preacher, a moment in time when those who are there sense the great glory of God, the majesty of God, his moral perfection, and they are moved to humility and repentance for sin. And is this not at the heart of our, our relationship with God? Humility and repentance. We must abandon our pride in ourselves and what we are able to achieve and repent of our sins in view of a holy God and receive uh, his gracious work of restoration, whereby our sin is removed and we are made holy before God. One of the things that we will see hopefully today is that God is holy, and yet he is a God who makes us holy. And that's the amazing thing. Um, God makes us who once were sinners to be saints. And our understanding of the new covenant position of the believer in Christ is that they are holy ones. That's what we mean when we say saints. It's not that they are morally perfect by any means, at least not in this life, but they are set apart for God. They have the presence of God in their lives, and so they become holy, just as the presence of God made the temple holy where the presence of God made the burning bush in the wilderness holy when Moses approached it. The presence of God within the church of God makes the church a holy place. And uh, may God so bless our ministry and others as well that his presence uh, resides within our church, among our people, and his presence is obvious among us such that uh, those who are yet outside of Christ uh, will be able to say God is truly in their midst. Uh, that is truly um, the heart, I think, of revival and the heart of a great work of God, a sense for the holiness of God. So we're going to look at what Dr. Sproul has to say on this subject of uh, divine holiness. And uh, I think it'll be a very helpful, uh, productive uh, study for you here today. So let's get started. Uh, in my copy of this edition, it's on page uh, 47. Chapter 16, it's clear we have a long ways to go yet before we're finished here, so we got a lot to consider. 
Uh, we continue to make our way through an understanding of the nature and attributes of God. And so that's where we're at in the course of our uh, study here. Dr. Sproul writes as follows. The first prayer I learned as a child was the simple table grace. God is great. God is good. And we thank him for this food. I suppose this prayer is supposed to rhyme. It did when my grandmother said it because she pronounced food as if it rhymed with good or hood. And so let me repeat that uh, rhyme for you. God is great, God is good, and we thank him for this food. <laughs> That's, I suppose, uh, something of an old way of uh, speaking. I don't know if that would be Dutch or Scotch. Uh, certainly I think it would be Scottish uh, in its uh, background. But um, when I first read Dr. Sproul's comments here, it didn't appear to me that there was any problem with rhyming here, but now that he mentions it, it's become apparent that there is a little difference there. Not a big deal. Uh, Dr. Sproul continues, the two virtues assigned to God in this prayer, greatness and goodness, may be captured by one biblical word, holy. When we speak of God's holiness, we are accustomed to associating it almost exclusively with the purity and righteousness of God. Surely the idea of holiness contains these virtues, but they are not the primary meaning of holiness. And I, I would say that that has been my experience as well in thinking about the holiness of God. We are uh, confronted with the moral perfection, the purity of God. Uh, he, he, he cannot look upon evil. Um, he hates sin and corruption. And so he is a holy God. Um, but we're going to see that there's far more to this term than merely uh, a reflection on God's moral nature. Dr. Sproul continues, The biblical word has two distinct meanings. The primary meaning is apartness or otherness. When we say that God is holy, we call attention to the profound difference between Him and all creatures. It refers to God's transcendent majesty, His august superiority, by virtue of which He is worthy of our honor, reverence, adoration, and worship. He is other or different from us in His glory. When the Bible speaks of holy objects, or holy people, or holy time, it refers to things that have been set apart, consecrated, or made different by the touch of God upon them. The ground where Moses stood near the burning bush was holy ground because God was present there in a special way. It was the nearness of the divine that made the ordinary suddenly extraordinary, and the common, uncommon. If you were to take a look at the Hebrew words underlying what we describe as holy, um, the basic root of the word is kod, which means uh, to cut in Hebrew. Uh, the word for holy is kadash, and here cut is at the root of it, so it's cutting, making a separation between two things. And God is holy, he's set apart. And so he is transcended above us. Um, we might be mindful of the great distinction between God as our creator and us as his creatures. Uh, God is so far above us that it, too often in our modern age we tend to think of God as the man upstairs. And so we're thinking of God as something of a superman, as a benevolent uh, grandfatherly figure who... Uh, looks upon us as his children and takes care of us and that kind of thing. But the, the image that the Bible presents is one who is qualitatively different. He is God, the creator, everlasting, eternal, uh, almighty. And this is the one with whom we have to do. And so he is far above us in his majesty. And anyone who wishes to understand the holiness of God needs to come to grips with the... Uh, distinction in natures between God and us. We are not pantheists. We do not believe that the uh, being of God is a part of this world order. Uh, really, there are only two 
points of view. Either uh, you have the God who is the creator over all, is distinct from his creation, or you identify God with the creation. And so God becomes a part of this world order. And that is really uh, what underlies paganism. You might see it reflected in such things as the climate change movement, where uh, the earth is mother nature, and uh, it's not to be touched, not to be affected by humanity. In fact, humanity is more of a, a stain on mother nature. Uh, there is a reverence for nature in this respect that goes beyond, really, our understanding of it as a creature made by God and under our stewardship. So a whole different worldview at work there, pantheistic world. Uh, we need to guard ourselves against that as Christians. There's a Christian uh, stewardship of the earth. There's a Christian concern for the environment and environmentalism. But that is distinguished from the pagan view of environmentalism, which uh, idolizes the earth, idolizes that which is natural, and uh, uh, subsumes man to uh, nature in, in that respect. Um, so the holiness of God confronts us with the majesty of God, his greatness, how he is far above us, and uh, his presence in different ways uh, makes uh, things around him to be holy as well. Okay, the secondary meaning of holy refers to God's pure and righteous actions. God does what is right. He never does what is wrong. God always acts in a righteous manner because his nature is holy. Thus we can distinguish between the internal righteousness of God, his holy nature, and the external righteousness of God, his actions. I pointed out to the men this morning that um, th this side of the holiness of God is something that also we need to come to grips with. I think we tend to, uh, where, where we accept the idea of God as creator and God being holy, we tend to just kind of brush over this idea of his moral perfection and pay it little regard. But um, the uh, doctrine has great consequences uh, for our spiritual lives. Uh, not only uh, transforming our worship services such that we recognize that we are in the very presence of God when we gather for worship and um, uh, that worship should reflect uh, the glory of God by being reverent, um, uh, awe-inspiring. Um, there should be a, a great uh, sense of the presence of God in worship. But... The consequence of an understanding of God's moral perfection will be with regard to the way we look at the world around us, where we see that there's much that is imperfect. Indeed, there's much that is evil, and uh, many evil things occurring in the world today. And the temptation is uh, posed by Satan at the very beginning in the Garden of Eden. The temptation is to question the goodness of God or his moral perfection. Um, indeed, when you take a look at uh, skeptics of the Christian faith, um, they reject the uh, inspiration and inerrancy of Scripture uh, because the, the concept of God that they see in that Scripture is one that they cannot accept. Uh, it does not conform to their standards of righteousness and uh, goodness. And so when they read in the Old Testament how God destroys the earth with a flood, how he commissions Israel to go into the land of Canaan and wipe out man, woman, and child so that they might inherit the land, they look on these things and they say, how can a good God command this kind of behavior? And so they have a great problem with that. Um, I'm tempted to pull some books from my library here uh, that hold to those very things. Um, they, they are skeptical of the goodness and character of God. And that's clear, clearly, clearly not something reserved for theologians or the skeptics and critics, but uh, the common man out on the street at times wonders, where is God when he sees murders occurring and rapes and robberies and he, he himself experiences these things along with disease, 
dying death. Uh, our world is a very uh, troubled world. There's tremendous corruption, evil, and sin, and indeed death itself. So where is God? Where is his goodness? And uh, as I was suggesting to the men this morning, the, the temptation for us is to ascribe an evil character of God, just as Satan wanted us to do in the Garden of Eden. You recall in his temptation of Eve, uh, he posed the question, has God really said that you may not eat from any tree in the Garden of Eden? And of course, God did not exactly say that. He said, you may eat from any tree in the Garden of Eden except for this one, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But Satan uh, implied uh, 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 an, an evil nature to God. And, and that comes out as well in the further conversation with Eve where he says, uh, God knows that in the day that you eat of this fruit, you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And so he, he is inferring that God is an evil God, that he wishes to clutch to himself his own privileges and not allow them to be enjoyed by Adam and Eve. And so the benefits that nature has for Adam and Eve uh, transcend what God may give them. And in fact, God is hiding from them something that is present there in that tree. And so uh, Satan has from the beginning sought to, if you will, assassinate God, assassinate his character, destroy God, even as that comes to a climax in his attack on Jesus, as we read about it in the Gospels, culminating in his crucifixion. Um, Satan has been constantly trying to destroy God, which obviously is a futile thing to do, but um, Satan is uh, busy at work at that. And he tempts us to follow along in that worldview, such that we are the ones who are basically good, and God needs to conform to our moral standards. And if he does not conform to our moral standards uh, in his revelation of himself in the Old Testament and so forth, then we need to reject that God. And we need to construct a new God made and fashioned in our own image. And that's what occurs in our modern age. In humanist uh, theology, humanist churches, you have essentially... Uh, God uh, being uh, uh, a reflection of our own human nature and what we would value in God. And so the value system of the Bible is replaced with a new humanistic value system that values uh, pluralism, diversity of viewpoint, tolerance of all different points of view, uh, these kinds of things. And then, of course, tolerance of different kinds of behaviors as well. And uh, so in, in our modern age, we have rejected uh, the uh, transcendence of God and his moral character. And so we bring God down from the heavens, make him a part of this earth, and we reject the moral character given to us in Scripture about the true God. We dismiss that and reinterpret it in terms of what we consider to be uh, worthy of God. And so God is... Uh, loving, unconditional love of whatsoever comes his way. He just continually loves and loves and loves. And that is the modern conception of God. He is a God of love. The holiness of God recedes from the background, is done away with. And so the sense that God being holy it cannot look upon sin with any favor. Uh, the fact that God is holy means that God must strike out injustice against wickedness and punish sin. That concept is removed because it's a most unpleasant concept to modern man. Uh, God is simply love, and that works out very well for us um, in a humanistic worldview. And so uh, what we need to be reminded of is that uh, God is good in the midst of the various tragedies and evils of the world around us. And it's our problems that needs to be uh, addressed. And so God's purpose in allowing the great corruptions and evils in the world is, uh, works itself out in a number of levels. On the one hand, he is patient with the wicked, allowing them time to repent and to change. At the same time, he is working out his purpose in history and time in redeeming a people for himself from the mass of mankind so that they might be saved. 
And as time goes on, these elect people are gathered from the ends of the earth and brought into Christ's church. And so they are unique and distinct and made holy in the midst of a corrupt, dying, evil world. In the end, all of the evils will be rectified. God will judge and punish the wicked, and God will save his church. And the way that we are saved is not because we were exceedingly righteous or good or what have you, but because we have been transformed by God's holiness through Christ. And he has borne the penalty for our sins, and he's covered us with his perfect righteousness. And that is the hope of the gospel itself. And so uh, the, the holiness of God and a proper understanding of that uh, guards us against uh, the temptation of Satan to demean God and to decry him as one who is wicked and corrupt. Sproul continues, Because God is holy, he is both great and good. There is no evil mixed in with his goodness. When we are called to be holy, it does not mean that we share in God's divine majesty, but that we are to be different from our normal fallen sinfulness. We are called to mirror and reflect the moral character and activity of God. We are to imitate his goodness. Uh, I would remind you that in the New Testament, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, all those who are members of local communities of churches in the New Testament, are called what? Saints or holy ones. Uh, we are made holy by Christ. We're set apart from the rest of the world as God's elect. We're set apart from the world, set apart for God, and God dwells in our midst. And we are being transformed by the presence of God in our lives. And so uh, there will be this uh, gradual transformation of the human heart and mind, whereby the moral perfections that God has are gradually, slowly, uh, but surely implanted and imputed within the lives of those whom God has set apart for himself. We're not saved because of what we do. We're saved because of what Christ has done for us. But in view of what Christ has done for us, we are made new, and we live in the holiness of God. So saints are not a category reserved for superhuman, if you will, individuals who lived a superb life and whose goodness not only was sufficient to save them, but also they had a superabundance of good works that are now communicated to uh, ordinary people through the medium of the church. This, of course, is what the Roman Catholic Church teaches. They deny that Christian people are saints in general. They reserve the word saint for those who are uh, canonized by the church. And so the church becomes the instrument through which an individual is elevated to the status of a saint and therefore entering into heaven. I recall years ago that that the highly regarded Pope John Paul uh, and uh, as well uh, Mother Teresa, when they passed, it was said of each of them that they did not know whether they would go directly into the presence of God, whether they would enter into heaven. They anticipated that they would need to be purged of their sins uh, through an experience of purgatory. Um, as far as I know, and I may be wrong, but uh, as far as I know, neither of them has been canonized by the church yet. Now, I could be wrong about that. Uh, but uh, the idea is that really salvation is through the church. In the Roman Catholic concept, the church needs to recognize that the Pope or Mother Teresa has performed some miraculous work on earth uh, and that is evidence then of their uh, sainthood, and then they are declared to be saints. Uh, that's certainly not what you read about in the, the Bible. When you open the epistles of Paul to the churches, he greets the church as the saints, uh, those who are in Christ Jesus and made holy through him. And so all of God's people, from the least to the greatest, if they are joined to Christ, if they are in union with Christ through faith, they are presently saints here on this earth. So, I am a saint. You are a saint if you are a believer in Christ. 
Uh, we are saints not because of our uh, super good works, our extraordinary good works, but because of Christ's work in covering us with his perfect righteousness. And incidentally, is it not rather um, offensive to say that uh, there are some whose good works are so great that they not only save themselves, but they provide a treasury of mirth by which other saints might be able to draw and be helped by that. Uh, seems to me that the gospel points us to Jesus Christ and to his righteousness and his moral perfection. Because he is both God and man, his good works have an infinite value and he is able to cover all of his people with his perfect righteousness. So if Christ covers us with his perfect righteousness, what do we need of saints? What do we need of their extra good works and somehow accumulating them for ourselves? That is most offensive to the work of Christ. It demeans his work. It shortens his work and says that it must be added to by the saints or by our own good works. And that is destructive of the good news of the gospel, which says that Christ has done it all. He's provided a full atonement for our sins and complete perfect righteousness for us so that we live by faith in Christ. He is the object of our faith, not ourselves, not the saints, but Jesus Christ and him alone. And so the Roman church leads many, many people astray when it invites them to look to the saints, to pray to Mary and the saints, or to expect some indulgence from heaven or through the church to help us on our journey to heaven. Uh, that is most offensive to the holiness of God, the perfect holiness of Jesus Christ, and his righteousness that is imputed to us through faith. Uh, we have everything that we need in Jesus Christ. And really to... Uh, look elsewhere is an offense to Christ. It's an offense to the gospel. And uh, the Apostle Paul will say that if anyone preaches a gospel other than that which he preaches, and he did not preach the saints' good works, he didn't preach our good works, only the works of Christ, anyone who preaches another gospel is to be accursed. Um, you can read about that in Galatians chapter 1. Very serious things. So the holiness of God is a concept that we need to reflect on and uh, develop in, in the course of our lives. There are a number of places in the Bible that speaks of it. You recall that in Exodus chapter 3, Moses approaches the burning bush, and out from that bush a voice comes and says, Moses, take off the sandals from your feet, for you are standing on holy ground. What made that ground holy? Was it a unique place for worship? Was it a, a religious shrine? Was it um, some sort of a magical location? No, the very presence of God appeared at that moment in time, and while the presence of God was there, that was holy ground. And there's a unique, unique way in which God revealed or manifested his presence to Moses there. And so the holiness of God uh, required reverence on the part of Moses and deep humiliation before this God. You can see that as well in Isaiah as he is called to the prophetic ministry. God gives him this glorious vision of his uh, majesty in heaven. God seated on his throne with the seraphim standing before God and declaring to all who will hear, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, the whole earth is filled with your glory. And so as these majestic angels, these great creatures in heaven, look upon God and hide their faces, hide their bodies from the glory and majesty of God and just declare, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. They affirm in the most significant way the majesty, glory, transcendence, and moral perfection of God. He is holy. You recall that when we bear witness to something and to the truth of something, the witness of two or three is required to confirm something to be true. And so when they say, holy, 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 the seraphim uh, are affirming in the most solemn of terms that this God is holy. And so 
They were filled with the majesty and the glory of God. And you might reflect as well on the threefold nature of this uh, ascription of holiness as reflecting the threefold nature of God. He is three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so the Father is holy, the Son is holy, the Spirit is holy. And in fact, while God is holy, we have in this new covenant period of time the Holy Spirit who comes to dwell among us. And so it's as though there's this great climax, if you will, of holiness in the Spirit of God who is sent by Christ into the church to sanctify the church and to make us holy as well. Uh, so as the seraphim declare the holiness of God, it is amplified even beyond that into the new covenant period of time as God produces holiness within the earth, saving his people and dwelling in their midst. And so the great holiness was present there in that vision of Isaiah. And you recall Isaiah's response that he was a man of unclean lips, he said, and he dwelled among a people of unclean lips. So he was very conscious that in terms of his special calling, he was utterly unworthy of serving as an instrument of God's revelation. Uh, his lips were unclean, and he had to be purged by uh, uh, really Christ and his work, but it's under symbolic form uh, as the seraphim take uh, coal from the altar and uh, place it upon his lips to purge his lips. Uh, it's an indication that we need to be cleansed by Christ and set apart by him uh, to fulfill our commission as prophets or as ministers or as God's people in his kingdom. So that's another expression of the great uh, holiness of God. Uh, you know that God revealed his holiness at the temple and with the the, the priesthood and all these different ways God's presence comes down on the tabernacle in the wilderness and then on the temple in the days of uh, King Solomon and it transformed uh, the, the temple and made it a holy place and so not anyone could just simply waltz into the most holy place and have a conversation with God. I think too often today in our modern age we tend to think uh, in inappropriate ways about God. Uh, we talk to him as though he were the man upstairs and these kinds of things, or as our best buddy. And it's true that as we are united to Christ, we cry out to God as Abba, Father. It's a, a term of endearment as a, a child expresses love and affection for its father. And so there's an intimacy there which is uh, beautiful and unique and gracious. But at the same time, we, we need to be mindful that the God whom we serve is a holy God. And so in our worship services, there needs to be uh, reverence before this holy God. And uh, great awe should fill uh, our churches. I think I'll finish there uh, in looking at uh, the scriptures here with Dr. Sproul. I hope that that's been helpful to you. Um, again, I would remind you that the, the great... I think the great revivals of the church have come through the presence of God powerfully revealed in a special time and occasion like under Jonathan Edwards in his sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. What is that but a sense of the holiness of God in the presence of sinful creatures? And when uh, the holiness of God comes face to face with our corruption and evil, then uh, we just melt. And you think as well of... Um, the Apostle John in the book of Revelation where he sees the exalted Christ in his majesty and glory and what is his response but to fall down as a dead man before him. Uh, God is far above us and his holiness is overwhelming and when we have a sense for that we'll see that many will repent and turn to Christ. May God so bless us with his presence that we ourselves will be transformed more and more into his image and put off all those sinful uh, characteristics of our lives, and that as well others would come to know the Lord truly through Jesus Christ. And only through him can we be saved. Only through him, through this mediator, can we have a relationship with God. Well, may God richly bless you in the weeks to come, and may he watch over us according to his will. Uh, this is Pastor McLaren for First Presbyterian Church. We are a member of the Orthodox 
Presbyterian Church. We're not a part of the mainline Presbyterian Church, the PC USA. Um, I would urge you not to be a part of those churches. Uh, it's not to say that there might not be some that are faithful and true to the Word of God, but on the whole, it is a denomination that has abandoned the testimony of Scripture, uh, the, the glory of Christ and His work of salvation, and it has given itself over to a humanistic gospel message. And I would urge you not to be a part of that. And the same is true of the modern Lutheran churches, um, Methodist churches, uh, Episcopalian churches. Uh, you need to be careful. Baptist churches as well. Um, you need to um, be careful to be sure that the gospel that is being preached there is that which is consistent with God's word. It's, not, it's a God-centered message and not a humanistic, man-pleasing message. Um, there's too much of that going on today. There are other ways in which that manifests itself as well. But we are members of the Orthodox Presbyterian Church. Um, we hold to the historic Christian faith as it's come down to us through the centuries. And uh, we are the continuing tradition of this church. So may God richly bless you as you seek to serve him. Come join us Sundays at 930. Our church meets on the corner of 5th and Ray Streets in Berkesey. God bless. Take care. Bye.